All right, it is 1.30 PST. Are all of the panelists ready to go? Certainly. Sure. All right, fantastic. Well, I'd like to welcome everyone listening here. I'll put myself on video real quick. I um, just wanna welcome everyone to the first day of PopCon 2020. It's very exciting, this is finally here. Obviously we had to pivot, but I appreciate everyone pivoting with us on this. And for today, we have a live discussion of a series of asynchronous uh, lectures and papers that were already made available. You can go to the Mopop website if you uh, have not had a chance to check this out yet. Uh, and these are all uh, papers oriented around the theme of international relations, youth desire and politics beyond the US. And I'm just gonna very briefly introduce who's gonna be part of this. We have Pilho Kim, Xavier uh, Liverman, <coughs> excuse me, Dorothy uh, Finan, Alexander Lippman, and last but certainly not least, Andrew Hamlin. And so I'll go ahead and turn things over to our panel. Pilho, I think you're up first. Let me unmute myself. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. So uh, in, th in that order. So uh, I'll, I'll go my first two minutes. Um, well, I'm assuming that uh, the audience uh, you know, saw, the, saw the video that I uh, uh, made available on our Mopop uh, site. So uh, the topic of my paper uh, is uh, this uh, South Korean hip hop duo uh, called XXX, uh, which sounds like, you know, a porn name, but it, it is really not. Um, and uh, they uh, sort of, um, you know, uh, fashion themselves as a kind of a rebel uh, against the, uh, uh, you know, uh, Korean hip hop, South Korean hip hop industry called Go Cook It. Um, and uh, they employ this, you know, uh, industrial hip hop uh, to sort of go against, uh, go against the hip hop industry. So that is the, uh, the, the theme of, uh, my paper, and uh, along with my, you know, co-author, we did a, a, a go into a little bit of a, a rhythm analysis and uh, try to show you how sort of uh, unique their, their you know, rhythm and, and the beat is. Um, and that I just want to address a little bit that I uh, wasn't able to discuss in the 25-minute you know, uh, uh, video, which is that although. Uh, they portray themselves as, you know, sort of, you know, rebels and underground, uh, you know, uh, players. Um, they are actually uh, being backed by uh, two, uh, two of the most, big, uh, two of the biggest players in uh, uh, Korean, uh, you know, uh, music entertainment industry. One is uh, SM Entertainment, which is the uh, titan of, you know, K-pop, uh, K-pop industry. And the other is the South Korean government. Um, so they have, uh, you know, these kinds of backings. Um, so that's the side that is uh, not really well, uh, you know, known, but, you know, it's something to really think about. So I'll use my time. Um, okay, welcome everyone. Um, as I said, like uh, Pil Ali, I assume people have taken a look at the, the presentation or the title. And so I won't belabor too much other than just to say that um, part of what I'm really interested in with this discussion of Kwaito is um, certain kinds of intergenerational conversations um, and, and shifts in how folks relate to um, the creation of music, um, the industry itself. Um, and I think ideas about what kinds of publics can be created um, through popular music. So a lot of the discussion um, in the in the larger project and also a little bit in the in the book was about questions of propriety and and um, intergenerational performances of identity um, ranging from uh, race and ethnicity to gender and sexuality. So I look forward to any questions or comments and I will um, pass it over to the next panelist. Hi, uh, my name's Dot and I'm a, I'm a doctoral student um, from the UK. Uh, my project is about, um, in just in case you haven't had a chance to look at the presentation, it's about a type of Japanese pop music that you might have heard of called idol music. The word idol has got a lot of different meanings that I go over very briefly, like you might have heard Korean idol, but these types of pop idol are really set apart in the fact that most of the performers are teenagers, 
and they sing loads about being a teenager. So if you can imagine a, a chart that's filled with songs about being at school, being at university, that's the sort of thing we're talking about. So I've done uh, some analysis of a corpus of these types of lyrics. And also I've had a chance to chat to some lyricists about that. So if you have any questions about any of that sort of stuff, please go ahead. And I'm really excited to take part in the discussion today. I'm happy to pass over to the next person. Is that me? <laughs> I'm Alexandra Littman and I am an anthropologist who works on um, music and the politics of sound in Brazil. I focus on funky carioca and I'm particularly interested in, and the paper speaks towards kind of questions of authorship and intellectual property. I'm, I sort of, wanted to, with this paper, track how authors and names either emerge and circulate or disappear from circulation. Um, so I looked at two practices ethnographically. Um, one is called carimbo. It's where MCs uh, will stamp, um, that's the word carimbo, names of DJs, radio stations, um, websites into their songs so that they can email that particular song to that particular DJ and then they can hopefully um, this will kind of convince them to play the music because now it's become a song that is um, kind of like a tribute to them and their fame and they're end up, they end up circulating the names and kind of giving the pseudo authorship to um, people who don't who didn't have anything to do with the production of the music but do have to do with the circulation of it and I contrast that um, with this practice of creating and circulating loops, which are, they use the English word, which are short segments of sound, uh, which the DJs and producers will use to produce music. And these loops are never titled with, um, nobody would title uh, a loop with their own name. So it's this kind of anonymous commons that's bounded by this community of music producers and uh, the music itself is considered something owned in common. So I'm kind of interested in, in questions of how intellectual property and the commons and also um, this kind of practice of carimbo come about in funky carioca, which is a sat sample based Afro Brazilian music with links to Miami bass and freestyle uh, and f American funk, but also Afro Brazilian traditions um, that are kind of remixed in that have been remixed into the music since the early 2000s. So I'm, I'm curious about uh, this conversation that we're going to have here. Well, that would leave me. I'm talking about Menudo. I think this might be coming out reversed, but I'm assuming everybody saw the video, the rise and fall of Menudo and the pros and cons of kicking a member out once a member turned 16, if not before. I think I did reasonably well under the circumstances. Granted, I don't know anything about video technology and I think my video reflects that. I was happy enough to do what I did. I think there's a, a room for a lot more exploration here. If I had had the means, uh, I would have talked to Menudo fans over the decades, uh, different people who of course are different ages, uh, remembering different lineups of the band and compared and contrast their reactions. I might have tried to get a hold of some band members themselves. Uh, I found the entire concept interesting, especially since it relates to the movie Logan's Run, and that's what gave me the idea for the title of my paper. And I found, as I mentioned, that uh, I liked their music a great deal more than I was expecting to like their music. And it stuck with me in a way that I uh, was not expecting. So I think I did a reasonably good job of scratching the surface, but uh, as I have mentioned here, uh, there's a room for a lot more exposition. And somebody, probably not me, somebody who is fluent in Spanish could write a book, I think, because it's that fascinating with topic. Uh, that's about all I have to say. Thanks. 
All right. I would like to open things up um, to start with if there are any, if any of the panelists have questions or comments for any of their fellow panelists, uh, we can start there before we open it up to the uh, larger peanut gallery. Not to put you all on the spot. Am I, am I right to ask a question? Yeah, please. Thank you. Uh, this one is actually for uh, Andrew. Um, so I hope that um, this like leads into something you're about to ask as well. I, don't, um, I found this such an interesting presentation because um, anyone who knows anything about Japanese popular music knows that this has been a concept in Japanese boy, boy bands, but especially girl bands since the 19, kind of late 1990s, early 2000s. Um, where there is still to this day a girl band where all the members leave around sort of the age of 16, 17, 18. And this is an established part and they have different generations of members and they leave and they, and they come. And it is, it's very long standing and successful. The producer who came up with that idea in Japan said that he got the idea because he wanted it to be more like, he wanted it to be more relatable for the people watching it. And he wanted it to kind of mimic the high school graduation. Um, so I'm wondering, like, is that at all um, included in the Menudo concept? And if in, if not, then um, do you think this has been replicated in any other context that you know of? Sorry if that's a bit long-winded. Well, thank you. Not in any other, other context that I'm immediately aware of, but there is certainly room for a lot more research. I, I think that the age limit, as I tried to explain in, in the, as best I could, is a function of Edgardo Diaz, the founder, having as much control as he can possibly have. Uh, not, that, that's not the only factor, but it's a leading factor. If he keeps them young, he can keep them impressionable, uh, malleable, uh, they'll do what he says, they won't ask questions, and uh, they can continue to appeal to an audience of teenagers, which I believe is some of what you were getting at, uh, because they stay perpetually young, they can always cater to a fresh audience of often teen girls and more discreetly some of the boys who are about that age. I, I believe they were, they were certainly marketed at teen girls, but it is possible to interpret painfully tight pants in, in more than one context. So uh, does that answer your question? Thank you. That's really interesting. I, I might have to do some more reading myself after this discussion. Thanks. Any other panelists have questions for their fellow panelists? All right, we have a question from uh, the gallery here. This comes from JD uh, Considine, and it's a question for Dorothy. Could you speak to the class aspect of the idol business? Teens who go into idol academies kind of risk it all in the sense that if they fail, they've not only failed to become stars, but they've lost their best shot at entering university and getting into the job stream. So often, aren't these teams unlikely to be uh, good students or comfortably middle class, unquote? Well, thank you so much for asking that, because that's basically the subject of my doctoral research, the, the aspect of struggle and how the idea of struggle figures in the idea of a young person in the public eye doing their best, kind of being a bit rubbish, but still trying anyway. Um, this might be something um, that I have to defer to another panelist's expertise for, but um, in terms of like Korean idol academies, but in, in Japan, Idol academies, so to speak, they exist in a part-time way. So you'd attend whilst you were going to secondary school, whilst you were going to university. It's kind of like a really intense, um, intense school club, and it's meant to mirror that, and that's meant to make it somewhat, somewhat relatable as well. Um, so in the, the fact that they might fail um, or that they might not do well is actually part of the... Um, part of the appeal and as to the class aspect it's really difficult to tell about the participants because it's not something that's commonly spoken about in contemporary idol culture in the 80s and the 70s and 80s you get many more um young pop idols in japan talking about oh i've had a really difficult time but now if you talk about that stuff it sets you apart um 
but so I'd really like to know because I've mostly just talked to lyricists and looked at lyrics so I can't fully answer your question but if somebody gives me some money I'll totally go and research it sorry is that any help at all Other questions, comments? And again, if you if you raise your hand in the Zoom tool, um, they will unmute you or you can ask your question in the chat either way. I had a question for Professor Finan, if I may. You talk a fair amount in your presentation about karaoke, which is one of my favorite pastimes. Um, can you explain just for a few minutes how karaoke feeds into and supports uh, the idle situation, if, in, if indeed it does that at all? And, and could you explain a little bit about the differences between Japanese and, and Western karaoke? First of all, I'm, 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 not, I'm, not, I'm fortunately not a professor. Um, I'm, a, I'm a humble PhD student. Um, but that's a really good question. My, um, my undergraduate thesis supervisor, who's, a, who's called um, William W. Kelly, he's written a lot about um, karaoke in Japan and the UK. And the main difference that I know from his research, although though it's better to probably go and read it directly, is that um, I, I'm not sure about the US, but in the UK, you do karaoke only when you're incredibly, like really drunk. Like people, you go to a public place, you go to a bar, or a pub and you do it and you're really really drunk um whereas and you're kind i mean you are supposed to be a bit rubbish um and i'd say that is where the commonality lies because um in japan definitely the being rubbish and still trying is something that makes idol songs appealing to sing the fact that the singers themselves may not be able to sing them very well but you yourself are having a go and that the performers themselves of these songs um, which may I add aren't like necessarily representative of all music, but are very popular. The fact that the performers themselves are a bit rubbish is part of what makes them more karaokeable. And certainly the difference being that the music industry in Japan is in the 90s very designed around producing karaoke hits, which is not the case, at least in the UK. But I'm not sure about the US. And I'll link you to that, his work um, in the um, comments. I'll just go and find it. I have a couple of questions. Um, so I was wondering, how, well, there are two questions, maybe you can d decide which one to take, but I'm curious, uh, maybe for all of the panelists, um, how the, the ro what the role of the state has or doesn't have in supporting or repressing uh, the genres of music that you work on. Um, and then, I also, completely different question, but I was wondering how um, maybe particularly for uh, Kwaito and um, for South Korean hip hop, industrial hip hop, uh, how um, kind of what are the gender politics in the music production and also performance of the music? Because I know um, with Funky Karaoke, the, for, to answer sort of both questions, the 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 state has been typically um, through the police kind of quashing performances, at least in the favelas. Although on the flip side, um, the state was, or different parts of the state, like the Ministry of Culture, was supporting funky karaoke by kind of recognizing it as culture, but that was only in the formal parts of the city, um, the wealthier areas where it's not seen as a threat as much. Um, so that's like a, an interest of mine. And then um, in terms of genre or gender and genre in funky karaoke, um, although some of the most famous MCs right now at least have been women, um, producers and DJs are I mean, with the exception of one or two DJs, all men. And I mean, there's some different reasons for that, but I'm interested in, in hearing more um, from you guys and maybe choose which question to answer or, or answer both of them. Thank you. Um, I 
Phil, if you don't mind, I'll just uh, jump in. Um, um, with Kwaito, I mean, one of the reasons why Kwaito was able to, I mean, just an additional reason for why it was able to circulate um, a bit more in the immediate post-apartheid period were, were changes in the South African government about how much local content um, needed to be played on radio stations. And so um, Kwaito in many ways was able to fill a lot of that um, void um, that was the tension between playing local content versus ratings, right? Um, and so um, in many ways, quite so kind of filled the void because it was popular in a way that some of the more traditional or neo-traditional um, musical forms were not, um, but then still allow radio stations to kind of meet their local um, content quota, a uh, quota, excuse me. Um, and I'm not sure actually what's happened to that in more recent times. I feel like some of those rules have been relaxed, um, but I think that the the local music industry has really grown to the extent that it's it's. Um, particularly for those stations that cater more to a Black South African audience, that's not really an issue. Um, with respect to gender and genre, absolutely, it's a, a male-dominated form, both in the artist, um, both in the producers, um, both in, um, and to a lesser extent, the cultural commentators, which is interesting, kind of the cultural brokers. But um, um, I think that part of what I try to get at um, a little bit in, in, in my work is the way that uh, women, queer folk, um, people who were sort of um, not necessarily as easily or obviously empowered um, in that space kind of use that space to their own uh, use. And some of that was um, oftentimes at the level of fandom, right? So the fandom oftentimes was a bit more expansive, diverse, and, and interesting um, as far as gendered identities. And that doesn't mean there weren't some very famous women in Kwaito and still are, but it is definitely a more male-dominated form. Okay, so uh, let me talk a little bit about the uh, the government's role in you know South Korean music uh, business, and uh, I would say um, the government's role changed uh, dramatically. Um, so back in the uh, the era of authoritarianism, government basic role was a censor, and then you know with uh, democratic transition that started taking place in the late 1980s, and really sort of uh, you know peaked in the 1990s. Uh, by the end of the 1990s, so took about 10 years to transition to, uh, you know, fully civilian democracy. And by that time, uh, government became uh, probably the biggest booster of, you know, cultural industry, including music business. So uh, you see, um, it's not just, uh, you know, hip hop and underground music that I, I mentioned, but you know, K-pop itself, the K-pop industry itself wouldn't have been, uh, you know, sort of globalized uh, uh, reach, uh, we wouldn't have globalized reach without the, you know, government support. Basically, the uh, entertainment, uh, you know, companies didn't really think about going to, say, Latin America or even Europe, paying, you know, uh, you know, investing uh, their own money to, uh, you know, promote you know, their product. It was the government who, uh, you know, created this kind of environment and put their money into this. So uh, um, it has a, always, a, you know, a huge role in, uh, you know, whether it's negative or positive. Um, the other thing, the gender and uh, current hip hop industry. Um, well, again, hip hop, just like you know, in, in any other place, it's gender biased and uh, when you say sexist even. Um, not much different in Korea too. But um, I guess um, I talked about uh, you know, show me the money, uh, which is sort of a really important you know TV program, uh, uh, audition program uh, in Korean hip hop, and they had this. The same, I, I believe it was the same cable uh, uh, network who created Unpretty Rap Star, uh, which is about the uh, audition program for female rappers. I'm not sure if it's still uh, going on, but uh, you know, as the name, you know, the title suggests Unpretty Rap Star, so it just drips with, uh, you know, sexism.
There was a question from Rob Drew um, about Menudo, uh, which is that I know there's been some great recent work on boy bands. Is there anything that looks specifically at the Svengali's? Don Kirshner was famously controlling when he could do no when he, when he could no longer control the monkeys. He created a cartoon band, the Archies. Marie Starr of New Edition and New Kids on the Block fame was an interesting figure as well. Uh, figure as well. It feels like there's a project to be done there. Unquote. Yes, I, I think there's a lot of potential there. I read years ago about Maurice Starr and how he, uh, let's see, his construction of New Kids on the Block. Uh, when he lost uh, New Edition, they, they went their own ways. They broke with him. And a reporter asked him what he learned from his years with New Edition. And he said six words to keep the paperwork in order. Is that six words? And I wish I knew more because obviously there's more research to be done here. But JD's wondering if New Kids on the Block was revenge. Well, it played out like revenge because he was able to make them so big. But New Edition was black, New Kids on the Block were white, and we can't ignore that. I don't, I'm not aware of any extensive looks at the Svengali's beyond these occasional feature pieces in magazines, uh, which of course are governed by how much the Svengali wants to reveal himself, which is often not very much. They tend to like being behind the curtain and they don't like having the curtain pulled back as a general rule. But there's a lot of potential there. And as I said, there's quite possibly a book So, all right, to speak, to speak quickly on that, I'm not sure, just really quickly. In Japan, like, um, star kind of producers behind girl bands and boy bands often are personalities in their own right. Um, I think JD Considine kind of touched on one such persona in the comments. Um, and one of these um, girl, girl band producers has, famous, has famously compared, or I've read an article where he's compared the potential members of a girl band to chickens free range chickens and that he picks them from the wild from the the i don't know what analogy this is and he they're not domesticated they retain their wild nature and that's why they're so appealing to consumers i remember just think that's very weird but he's so they definitely feel like these people really mostly men really feel like they've got some kind of vision and no matter how old it is I think we have time for one last one. And Karen Tonkson wanted to ask a question of both Pill and Alexandra about whether or not uh, it actually is, as Pill cites in his presentation, is it possible to, quote, plagiarize a beat or how exactly ownership plays itself out in the national context that each of you are working with? Well, I thought, uh, you know, that quote uh, from uh, Kim Shimia was kind of a you know, his, his bragging that nobody can really, you know, plagiarize our beat. Um, so if, they, uh, I, I don't know, uh, I haven't really, you know, really thought about, uh, you know, maybe copyright on, on, on a beat. That's probably, there's some research out there about, about this among hip hop scholars. So uh, I would be interested in, uh, you know, what, what, what you guys actually think about. Um, in terms of the, so in, in Funky Karaoke, there seemed to be a difference between how the beat or in, instrumentals were treated and voices, although it, it can break down. Um, you know, people would, it's, it started off, the genre started when DJs would sample Miami bass and freestyle and electro records, and then they started to make their own loops um, with either that or, uh, you know, their own productions. Um, but nobody worries about or was worrying about that. But um, if, if musicians were kind of stealing each other's lyrics, that was something that was constantly debated and discussed. And uh, so there wasn't as much of a or people didn't seem to be concerned about sampling as much as, um, you know, stealing someone's lyrics. And that would typically, sometimes that happened because it would be, you know, people would be freestyling in, in a group of friends and then um, one musician would take this kind of collectively composed 
um, song and then record it and register it for himself. And then that was contentious, especially if the song what became popular. So the one, uh, I think, yeah, I think I write about this. There's, um, there, there is a song that is called Happy Das Armas, means weapons wrap. And there are two kind of very popular versions from the 90s. One is in the genre Proibidao. So it's like sort of gangster rap and it's glorifying gang violence. And um, the other version is conscious rap. So it's um, decrying violence in Brazil. And both versions became very popular and then around like when World War, with the World Cup in South Africa happened, um, that song, uh, the sort of Proibida version um, was remixed by a European DJ. And then though that group toured Europe and South Africa and the other group who sang the conscious version was very upset um, because they claimed that they had created it first. So that's where the, the debate usually happens is around lyrics more than um, beats. And on that note, we are at two o'clock. So I want to just thank all of our panelists first and foremost, but also all the participants for joining us on today, the first day of PopCon 2020. We have one session left. That's in the other uh, conference room. Uh, for those of you who might have registered for it about countries, Benjamin Button syndrome, uh, that'll go until three o'clock. And otherwise we will be back here tomorrow morning with day two of PopCon 2020 at 9 a.m. PST. Thank you. Thanks to all.